Uh, right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Joel Goodchild. I'm a um, senior scientific investigator at Ar Archaeological Research Services. Um, and the um, presentation we're doing, I am doing today, is depicting multi proxy data for enhanced landscape evaluation. And really, this presentation is the result of a lot of conversations that we've had whilst applying different um, aerial prospection techniques um, on the archaeological sites. Um, so just looking at the implications that they have for archaeology. Um, right. There we go. So in terms of the Archaeological Prospection Service, what is it? Sorry, I'm having trouble clicking. I don't think anybody else has. Is that trouble clicking? No. It's just, just the arrows. Oh, I'm trying, yeah. <laughs> All right. Is it, is it? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yes, that's working now. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, we're kind of developing this approach. Um, it's a, it's, it is an approach to archaeological survey that combines a range of terrestrial and airborne prospection techniques to gain new insights into the archaeological record. Through a combined approach, we can provide an effective means of archaeological evaluation across large areas. And by engaging with the archaeological record in different ways, hopefully create more compelling narratives that resonate with the public and contribute to society. Um, in this presentation, I want to show how, different integ how integrating different techniques forces the archaeologist into a position where they must reconcile different data sets and engage with the complexity inherent in our sites and landscapes. This creates a fantastic opportunity to ask new questions, um, then go on to inform mitigation strategies and conduct research into the past that makes a significant contribution to our understanding of contemporary issues. Whether it's climate change or the disruption caused by emerging technology, past societies face many of the same challenges that we face today. We believe it's imperative that we as archaeologists use all of the tools and techniques that we have available to us to improve our understanding of past change in order to better orientate ourselves in the present and guide us in the future. I think that given all of the kind of development of all these techniques, I think we've got a pretty good chance of um, really um, contributing to these really big issues in society that we're all aware of um, and I'll be taking you through some of these now. Um, so in terms of how we got to um, persuading um, ARS to actually invest in um, a lot of this drone technology, it's very expensive. Um, our adoption of um, UAV technology within RES, ARS um, stemmed from the question that resulted from aerial mapping in the Cheviot Hills in Northumberland. And this is a landscape that has be beguiled archaeologists for generations due to the richness of the archaeological record in the area. Um, just in terms of the utility of LIDAR for this project, um, just take you to a clough that's just on the side of Yevering Bell, which is here. Can't see particularly well in this photograph, but um, on the ground, um, you can see a hollow air. We can also see a, um, an enclosure. Um, and not, I can, I can see my notes actually, I think. So yeah, yeah, cheers. Um, whereas if we go to the LIDAR, which isn't showing up particularly well in this image, um, we can see a range of different, a profusion of different monuments that are visible in the um, LIDAR. And if we go to mapping these features, which we did as part of the project, um, you can see everything really from unenclosed hut circle settlements from the Bronze Age, right the way through to the um, Iron Age occupation of Yevering Bell itself, and these scooped Romana British settlements. Um, so LIDAR really contributed a huge amount to the project. Um, this did raise a question um, for me as you can see here, this is the um, distribution of archaeology. Um, I should say this was uh, funded by Historic England. Um, this, uh, which was very much around the periphery of the Cheviot Hills, very little was visible in the interior of the Cheviot Hills. Um, the Cheviot Hill landscape is um, it's a very open landscape. Um, and Today, it's not particularly hospitable. It's very open and it is very exposed. 
However, we know from pollen analysis that this is landscape that would have been populated by birch and alder trees and would probably have looked a lot more like this. So this is a photo I took ab above Grassington um, and we can see uh, birch and alder trees visible um, here. And it's a place that would have been a lot more hospitable in the Bronze Age. Um, so this kind of led me to questions through the project. Why aren't we actually seeing any of this archaeology within this area? Um, is it a true reflection of the archaeological record, or is it just that we're not picking up those features um, using one meter resolution LIDAR? Um, there's a site just here called House Ledge East, which was excavated by Colin Burgess from Newcastle University in the 1980s. Um, and here you can see, uh, we can see um, cairns visible in the LIDAR data, uh, which we did pick up. But the rest of the features were mostly um, mapped from a fantastic aerial photograph taken by Tim Gates, um, where you could see a lot of these features protruding just from a really thin layer of snow, um, as, as actually as vegetation protruding up from the snow. So this led me to um, this kind of answered the question. So we'd identified a problem which was site visibility. And the problem was that subtle earthworks, particularly relating to the Bronze Age, were just not visible in one meter resolution LIDAR. And because of immersion de technology, we actually had the opportunity to address this issue uh, through the use of high resolution UAV based LIDAR, where you can get down to this centimeter level um, accuracy. We also invested in multispectral thermal imaging. Um, there's the other problem, which was the infrequency of crop mark um, visibility. And we hoped that by using multispectral and thermal imaging, we could start to um, see crop marks more often. So having um, invested in a lot of this, uh, we uh, got project through that was in the Peak District. Um, this is a landscape that had been comprehensively surveyed by an experienced archaeologist in the past. Um, and he'd created very uh, good and comprehensive maps of this landscape. Um, and this presented a fantastic opportunity for us because we could apply some of the um, drone technology that we had um, invested in uh, to see what they would contribute, um, not only to visibility of sites in the area, but also compare it to um, the work by, of this experienced landscape archaeologist and to see, uh, kind of compare our results with that terrestrial survey. On one level, our results were really good. So we have the Environment Agency one meter LIDAR here. Um, there's a cairn field here, um, which, um, on which you can see about five different, maybe seven cairns, something like that. Um, when it actually came to applying the high resolution drone-based LIDAR, um, the number of cairns increases to about 25, 27, different cairns, uh, which was fantastic and is exactly what we'd hoped for. Um, so good results on one hand. On the other hand, um, the vegetational change over the course of the last 20 years um, had, did have an impact on our survey. So here we can see a Google Earth image from 1999, which is about the time of the original survey, um, which was a relatively well-managed um, landscape with cutting of heather and bracken. When it came to us doing our survey, I mean, just giant black blob there, um, this did impact um, the um, survey results. So we had um, extensive coverage of heather and bracken. You could call this rewilding. And this is what it looks like on the ground. Um, so this did have an impact on our, um, the visibility of these monuments. There's just no penetration, really, however high resolution sensor you use, they can get through this. So we were, had a conversation about this and we were faced with a bit of a conundrum, um, which was how do we um, kind of reconcile this? Um, on one hand, we have got better results. On the other hand, um, the results aren't as valid um, as we had hoped. And we came to the conclusion through discussion that increased accuracy and precision does not necessarily equal greater validity in the results of a survey. Um, in many respects, the, um, so the comprehensive surveyor on the ground 
um, uh, produce more valid results than we had managed to produce, um, which was an in which was interesting, um, and kind of shows just how the limit how we need to start understand the limitations of different technologies. Uh, another aspect of this, which uh, my colleague Dan um, raised, was that actually when you're doing a UAV survey, a lot of the times you've got your um, eyes on the drone itself which is obviously a safety precaution, you're not engaging with the archaeology on the ground um, in the same way that you would um, if you were going out onto the ground to conduct your survey. Um, this got me thinking about actually how do we approach sites in UK archaeology. Um, in terms, we have the site here on one end and we create the record on the other end. Um, if we're lucky, I mean, at least with a UAV based, UAV based survey, it's actually the person doing the processing and interpretation of the data is the person who's going out and collecting the data in the field. If we think about magnetometry, um, I've been doing a lot of magnetometry over the last couple of weeks, and um, a lot of the time, the field teams are not actually getting across and doing the processing and interpretation. Um, this is what people do after they've done about five years of walking up and down fields. And um, this is what people do when they're working to try and get into this position. So you actually, you actually end up in a position where the, um, the record is in some cases twice removed from the site itself. Now, um, what we're trying to do at ARS is to try and um, put the site into the middle of this. And I mean, we're probably, we're kind of getting there, uh, but to try and place the site in the middle of um, how we approach it apply a range of different techniques to the site um, where we end up and kind of approaching the site and um, going back there so that we have a recursive relationship with the site. And then at the end of that, in the processing and interpretation stage, trying to pull together all of these different techniques um, with UAVB mostly spectral, geochemistry and geophysics to then create the record. And I think that that then gets around this kind of linear progression from the site to the record. Um, and this goes back to what um, Bob was talking about earlier. Now, what we try to do is train everybody up in all of these techniques um, so, that it, so that we as archaeologists are looking at the site in different ways and um, placing the site and the record at the center of that. Now, in terms of a, sorry, I'm doing something odd here. Just not distracting up. There, there we go. Yes, there's a spoiler there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an HS2 site where, so we're getting onto some sites where we've tried to apply the LPS approach. Um, this is an HS2 site, which is Lower Radbourne in Warwickshire. Um, we can see here the site compound and stripping just starting to commence on the site. Um, now, if we look at um, this site, uh, this is actually the site of a deserted medieval village. And although it wasn't part of the scheme, we decided to apply a range of prospection techniques to the adjacent field in order to contextualize the archeology span that we were looking at on the site. Um, this is the kind of demarcation of HS2 and um, farmer's field ad adjacent to it. Um, so it's an order to contextualize the archeology span we were seeing and also to show off a bit about what we could do. Um, this was the uh, multispectral image that um, we uh, gathered for the site, which relates to the um, deserted medieval village. And here you can see the Holloways associated with the village. Um, this took about 40 minutes for us to complete this survey, as opposed to this survey, which took about four to five days with magnetometry. But I think what's really interesting about these results is when we compare these different data sets in relation to one another. So if we think of, um, we've got our Holloways in this image and the structural elements of the site in this image, um, which reminds me of, um, the, um, the kind of Saudi site that was, um, Jamie was talking about earlier, where we're seeing structures, but not necessarily use of space between structures. We can see, and um, they're both showing very different things. 
Now, if we think of Holloways as being a physical manifestation of movement through the settlement and compare this to the structural elements of the village shown in the geophysics, we can actually see how people moved in and around Lower Radbourne, not only through the main thoroughfares, but also by a network of uh, trackways, what I'd call ginnels coming from Leeds, around the back of here. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think this, this leads us to, I'm definitely confusing this. Um, this leads us to, um, if we were to, to think about mitigation strategies, this might lead us to think about actually um, what areas of interest have we got here and how would we target them? Ooh. Yeah, I've been pressing too many times. Okay, thank you. Um, if we look at the geophysics, we can see that this isn't just, um, we are getting the structures in the geophysics, but actually we are getting, we can start to define not just features and structures, but also areas where there isn't, um, let's do this again, where there aren't features. Sorry, this is my presenting style going. I don't understand why what you Oh, there we go. It's not the same as what you can hear. Yeah, I've done something like that. So, um, yes, so we've got the Holloways here, but we can also start to differ. These areas that would, we would think were blank on when looking at geophysics are actually areas where that defined by Holloways and where we've probably got something um, going on in these spaces between these, these structural elements. Uh, we did excavate a chapel in this area down here, and on the geophysics we can see that this is an area that is also one of these supposedly blank areas where we um, aren't seeing much in one data set. So these we also incorporating um, as part of the package um, geochemical survey. So this is the site of Yevering in Northumberland, um, which we looked at um, as part of research with uh, Durham University. And in the background, we can see some of the mapping that I did as part of the Northern Cheviots projects. And we can see copper enhancement across the site. And most of this enhancement is above uh, background copper levels of about 11 parts per million. Um, and we're getting up to 23, 29 parts per million across the site. If we compare this with um, zinc levels, we can see that there's interesting distribution of these different elements. And if we do the sum of copper, zinc, and lead, we can see um, definite structured enhancement around particular areas. Um, now, while the enhancements are not high enough to be indicative of metallurgical activity, they are well above background levels and are more likely associated with activities relating to settlement and the accumulation of waste, processing of foodstuffs, and aspects of storage. Does the lack of enhancement, interesting question, does the lack of enhancement around the, the kind of Beowulf-style um, feasting hall um, actually reflect that this building was used more for ceremonial practices, as opposed to these areas where we're seeing um, geochemical enhancement associated more with settlement activity. These are the kind of questions we can start asking at evaluation stage and then using that to inform mitigation. So the LPS approach not only provides a more comprehensive means of identifying and defining archaeological features, but also of determining the use of space between such features, which can be used to inform intrusive evaluation and mitigation. Um, it's been interesting watching everybody's, uh, everybody's um, presentations. I think there is a temptation to get fixated on features and defining them in ever greater detail. Um, whereas obviously it's the use of space, the kind of spaces that we inhabit between these features where we can um, really start to create, I think, um, in more interesting and compelling narratives about the archaeological record. So in conclusion, um, while advances in UAV technology and remote sensing allow us to visualise sites with greater clarity than ever before, there is a risk of a misconception developing that by using it, new technology we are able to see everything and that we become fixated on defining features in ever greater detail at the expense of meaningful interpretation. 
I kind of imagine the landscape archaeologist of the future going out into the fields um, with using a range of different techniques, probably um, with a drone and a PXRF in hand in order to um, approach um, different sites and, and extract the most meaning from them. But I do think that it is going to be out in the field um, when you have the experience of interacting with a site in the field um, that um, we're really going to, that they're the kind of moments where you really connect with the past. Um, and that's been my experience doing archeology. span So we suggest that it's important that we explore ways in which different prospection techniques complement each other, as well as their individual limitations to provide new insights into the archeological record that contribute to sustaining the future. I, I mean, that is a result of me trying to sustain my consciousness and uh, staying up to up too late at night writing this, but really um, the archeological record that can contribute um, to um, a more sustainable future that I should read. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>